Welcome. In this video, we will cover part two of chapter eight, addition reactions and alkenes. The next reaction that we will look at is catalytic hydrogenation. In this reaction, we will add H2 across a double bond. This reaction is going to require a lot of energy to, cr to go over the activation barrier, so we generally use a metal catalyst for this reaction. We can convert an alkene to an alkane using hydrogen and platinum. This converts two sp2 carbons into two sp3 carbons. This reaction will be stereospecific. This means that the two hydrogen molecules are approaching from the same side of the double bond. We'll get syn addition, which will create the two cis stereoisomers of the product. Without the metal catalyst, the addition of hydrogen gas is too slow due to the high activation energy. With the catalyst, we're significantly reducing the activation barrier for the reaction to occur. The metal surface binds to both the hydrogen molecule and the alkene, and it pulls these two molecules into close proximity of each other. This explains why we obtain the syn addition across the double bond. If the starting material is symmetrical, then we will not produce a pair of enantiomers. Since there is a line of symmetry within the molecule, a meso compound will pre be produced by the reaction. If we flip one of these two molecules over, it's the same exact compound as the other product. There are two types of catalysts that we can use for these reactions. We can use a homogeneous catalyst or a heterogeneous catalyst. The type of catalyst that we have is determined by the solubility of the catalyst. A homogeneous catalyst will not react in the, will not dissolve in the reaction medium. This would be like platinum or palladium. It would create a slurry instead. A heterogeneous catalyst is soluble in the reaction median and can use a ligand in order to make the catalyst more soluble. The Wilkinson's catalyst is a rhodium catalyst that has three triphenylphosphine groups attached to it. This would be an example of a heterogeneous catalyst because it's able to dissolve in organic solvents due to the nonpolar phenyl groups attached to the catalyst. If we start with a molecule, that has the opportunity to create a stereocenter, using the Wilkinson's catalyst, we can obtain a mixture of enantiomers. If we start with a molecule that has two potential chiral, center, chiral centers formed, then we would create a mixture of two enantiomers that have two chiral centers. In some cases, we can actually replace some of the ligands on the catalyst with chiral ligands. What this allows us to do is to take an achiral starting material and create one specific enantiomer of the product when the reaction occurs. For example, in this hydrogenation, we can take our chiral catalyst and add hydrogen across the double bond in a way that produces a new stereocenter in just one configuration. This ruthenium catalyst contains the BINAP ligand, which is also a chiral ligand. This allows us to convert an achiral starting material into a chiral product with high enantiomer excess when the reaction is complete. The next addition reaction that we're looking at is halogenation. In halogenation, we're going to add two halogen atoms across the carbon-carbon double bond. This reaction is the key step in the production of PVC from vinyl chloride. There are two types of halogens that we can use for halogenation, chlorine and bromine. Halogenation is going to occur via the anti-addition. This means that we'll end up with a trans product. It's important to note that the reactions, which go through a three-membered ring transition state, will often produce a trans product. The reactions in which both of the substituents approach from the same face will end up with 
the syn addition product. In this reaction, we begin with the alkene acting as a nucleophile. This creates a carbon-bromine bond. One of the bromines acts as a leaving group. If we employ the traditional mechanism, which we learned for hydrohalogenation for this reaction, we would expect a mixture of syn and anti-addition. This is because the carbocation that would be formed after the first step can be approached from either face. Since we don't observe any syn addition, this reaction must proceed through a different mechanism. This mechanism is the formation of the bromonium ion. In this mechanism, we form a three-membered ring with a bromine with a positive charge as an active intermediate. This intermediate is similar to the mercurium ion, and it follows a trend which we'll see where we, if we have a three-membered ring intermediate for these addition reactions, we generally end up with the antiproduct. After the bromonium ion is formed, the bromine leaving group will act as a nucleophile and attack the opposite face. This will end with the anti-attack of the bromonium ion and the trans product. Halogenation is a stereospecific reaction. This is due to the molecule being locked in conformation when the bromonium ion is formed. If we start with a cis-butene, we'll obtain these two products. If we start with the trans-butene, we'll obtain this meso product. The stereochemistry of the starting material determines the stereochemistry of the products. The next reaction that we'll look at is similar to the halogenation reaction, but instead of the bromine acting as the second nucleophile, we're going to have a, ha a water act as a second nucleophile. Halyl hydrons are formed when we employ the halogenation reaction in water. In this case, the water will act as a nucleophile on the bromonium ion. This is a way for us to produce a 1-2 substitution pattern with the halogen in one position and an alcohol in the next position. In this mechanism, first we form the bromonium ion. Nucleophilic attack occurs when water attacks the bromonium ion in SN2 process. And then finally, the product is liberated using a proton transfer to deprotonate and form the alcohol. This reaction can also occur with chlorine, where we can form a chlorohydrin as the product. Every new reaction we learn, we have to take into account both the regiochemistry and the stereochemistry. Since we're going to add two different groups to the double bond in this reaction, we need to be concerned with regiochemistry. In this reaction, the halogen will add to the less substituted position, and the alcohol will add to the most substituted position. When the bromonium ion is captured by water, the alcohol will the water will attack the more substituted carbon, which yields the proton, which yields the alcohol on the more substituted carbon. This regioselectivity results from the more substituted carbon having more cationic like character. The next set of reactions that we'll look at are the dihydroxylation reactions. In this series, we'll look at multiple sets of conditions which allow us to obtain both the syn and anti-dihydroxylation products. In order to form the anti-dihydroxylation product, we can use a two-step process. An epoxide is formed first, and then oxygen can undergo nucleophilic attack of the peroxide. Once again, we see a trend where a three-membered ring is formed as an intermediate. Whenever this occurs, the nucleophile will then attack from the back face and create the anti-addition trans product. The first step involves a peroxide rearranging to form an epoxide. This epoxide can be formed through most commonly used metachloroperoxybenzoic acid, or MCPBA. Once the epoxide is formed, it can react with water and an acid catalyst to form the anti-diol. Note the similarities between these key intermediates. All three of them 
yield antiproducts because the nucleophile must attack from the bottom face. They all obtain a plus one formal charge as well, which enhances the, nucleoph the electrophilicity of the carbon attached to these electronegative atoms. The next reaction that we'll look at is the syn dihydroxylation. In this reaction, the two alcohols will form new bonds from the same face of the pi bond, or in a syn fashion. This means that both oxygens are approaching the molecule from the same side. There are multiple sets of conditions that we can use for this reaction. Osmium tetraoxide is the first reagent that we'll look at for this reaction. Osmium tetraoxide is expensive and toxic, and it also requires a co-oxidant. Because of all these different factors, synhydroxylation is often achieved with potassium permanganate. This occurs with much more mild conditions, and it reacts with a variety. The potassium, per, uh, the potassium permanganate can react with a variety of other functional groups as well. The next process that we'll look at is oxidative cleavage. This is different than addition. We're going to undergo a much different mechanism to obtain these products. In this reaction, we're going to cleave carbon-carbon double bonds. In the process of cleaving these bonds, we're going to form two new carbon-oxygen double bonds. If we look at our starting material, we can think of taking a pair of scissors and cutting right down the middle of this double bond and inserting an oxygen on either side. What we result with is two carbonyl groups attached to the original alkene alkanes on either side of the double bond. In this reaction, we use ozone and dimethyl sulfide. Ozone exists as a resonance hybrid where we can have a negative charge on either of the terminal oxygens. The first step of this mechanism is the ozone reacting with the alkene to form an ozonide. The ozonide can then decompose to form our ketone product and a new ozonide. The new ozonide can then decompose an additional time to form our second ketone product. Often, we use a reducing agent like dimethyl sulfide to speed up this process. For each addition reaction that we look at, there's a three-step process that we can use to help us determine what the products will be. The first step is to look at the types of reagents that we have and use those to determine what types of groups will be added across the carbon-carbon bond. What will the two new functional groups be that we have on each side of the bond. Once we are able to obtain this information, we can then determine the mechanism of the reaction and use that to help us determine the regioselectivity and the stereoselectivity. We now have enough tools to begin thinking about synthesis. In synthesis, we analyze different starting materials and products and try to figure out a route of how to convert one molecule into another. The three major reactions that we've currently learned are the addition reaction, the substitution reaction, and the elimination reaction. If we're given a synthesis, we first analyze the starting material and then we analyze the product and think about what type of conditions and reagents will be needed to form the following product. In this case, we start with an alkene and we end with an alcohol attached to one of the carbons of the alkene. We know that we can do this reaction with a hydration reaction, adding an OH on one side of the alkene and an H on the other side of the alkene. At this, step, at this point, we have to decide which of the hydration reactions that we've learned will be useful. Since the OH is at the more substituted position, we're going to need a set of reagents that leads to a Markovnikov product. We can use water and sulfuric acid to obtain this product. In some cases, we might need to use multiple steps to obtain our product. Let's take a look at this reaction sequence. Here, we have a bromine attached to a secondary carbon, and then the product, it moves over to the tertiary carbon. We have not learned a single reagent that can perform this task. However, we have learned a two-step sequence which we can use to obtain this product. The first step is to use an elimination reaction to remove the bromine and form a double bond. 
Now we can re-add the bromine using our knowledge of hydrohalogenation reactions to get the bromine at the correct position. In this chapter, we've learned a variety of different reactions that can occur using an alkene as the starting material. In summary, the different addition reactions that we've learned will add one functional group to either side of the double bond.